Are they identified? Uh, it's Lev from the Survival Center. Okay. okay. I know a few other people asked about it, so I'm, I'm anticipating some more would will uh, will join. Okay. Not right now. I'm gonna share the uh, share the agenda if I can find it. Yeah, um, on, are you? Yeah. Okay. Um, the comments from the public hearing were they sent out? Uh, no, no, I didn't type up the minutes yet. Okay. All right, I just did want to make sure I didn't miss anything. No, I mean, just I think everyone was here for most of it. Um, you know, we had the survey results that I sent out, and um, is the problem with the hyperlink that there's just not a space after the two and before and? Um, yeah, I inserted a space before I cut. Yeah, I have that problem. Put it? Where did you put the space? For the two, between the just, hyperlink it, and the word. Oh, and a lot of times word will automatically oh. recognize it if you. Yeah. I was taking it from the heading. I don't know. I just think. Oh, I'm, thank right. God, my twenty-nine-year-old is at home to help me. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure what. Yeah. Sorry, I apologize. I was I was on the market sure. fifty-seven, but didn't get there. Um, so, are we ready? I think so. Um, and I don't think that we need to go around and introduce ourselves if we uh, if Lev's here because. Um, she was on the last call, but um, maybe quickly we can just go around and introduce ourselves for anybody else that may have hopped on at the last moment. Sure. So go ahead, Nathaniel. Hi, I'm Nate Malloy, a planner with the town. Um, Gail Lansky, I <laughs> chair this committee. Lucas? Uh, yes, Lucas Hanscombe. Um, I'm a new member. Um, and I got cut off last week. Sorry about that. that is, uh, I didn't think to call back in until around 9.15. Then I realized I could probably have used my phone, but by that point, it was I think it was too late. So sorry about that. Okay, Becky? Hi, I'm Becky Michaels, um, also a new member. Great, Nat? Paul Goldston, oh. an old member. <laughs> Nat? I'm Nat Larson, as indicated on my Zoom profile, and this is my second year going through this process. I'm just going down the down what's on my screen. Rika? Oh, you're silenced, I think. Rika Clement, um, I, maybe soon to be a member. Welcome. Andrew? Andrew Grant Thomas, I guess that makes me a middle-aged member. <laughs> <laughs> and we have Ben. Ben? Yep, uh, Ben Breger, I'm a planner with the town. Okay, so um, we're gonna just jump in and review the comments from the public hearing. And uh, there were additional comments added to the online survey, uh, quite a number of them, uh, many with comments. And so we can take some time to discuss the additional comments on this survey. Um, I, anybody wants, I have a lot to say, but I'll let other people go first. So uh, comments from the last meeting, hearing? Mm, okay. Yeah, actually, if you don't mind, um, the, that, as I was, when I was watching it, there, you guys talked a little bit about the formation of a ranking system. And I just, I wanted to just say that I think that would be useful, but I, I kind of don't think it's a good idea because it's just a can of worms for people to come back and, you know, sort of, try to say that we did or did not do the right thing because of the math, as opposed to just letting it play out. Do you mean a ranking system for as we create the priorities? Or right, the weight, the like the weighting for the rankings and all that. I, I like math and I like using it in a, in, in a use, and it could be useful, but I just, I, when I've, whenever you assign numbers from our end to things, I think it, it, gets, it gets problematic because then anybody people expect else? everything else to follow. Thank you, Lucas. Does anybody else want to add anything to Lucas's comment about um, ranking the activities as we touched upon a little bit at the last meeting? The only, um, I'll just offer a little uh, description of the way we've used the numbers, Lucas, um, and, and others, other newbies. <laughs> Broadly speaking, I think what we've done is to use the numbers uh, and our rankings, the committee members' rankings, to determine essentially the ones that are clearly ranked very high 
and the one hold on, hold on. I think I think Lucas is talking about the priorities, not the score sheet. Is that right, Lucas? About the priorities that Yeah, I was talking about our own priorities as far as like our, our rankings for things. Like you I think you had talked about the formation of an internal ranking system for Yeah, so for this where it says, you know, um, Yeah, and, and not not for the uh not, not for, for this. For, not for the matrix. Yeah, not for the matrix. Oh, I see. I Sorry, see. I didn't so, mean to. Catch, I didn't mean to cut you off, Andrew. Sorry. Right, so, right, you know, so you're I could not see our... what you were holding up. Oh, yeah. um, I'm just going to. It says type of activity. Yeah, I, I can share that when we get there. So. Okay. If, um, I can do a new share. The. Um, where are we? So for you know, right now for um, we usually have. Um, you know, the social service priorities. And so in years past, we have had, you know, six or so. So last year it was. Here it is. Household. Um, these few right here. Yeah, household, family, and individual stabilization, support services for those experiencing homelessness, youth development, and on and on. So we were brushed upon the possibility of ranking those. And Lucas is saying he doesn't think it is a good idea. Nate, has it ever, have we ever done it prior to my time on the um, committee? Have they been ranked? No, not that I'm aware of. I okay. think, you know, I agree there could be some difficulty, for instance, if we have one or two as the most important, you know, how, you know, do we, we have to come up with that, how do, would we factor that into a score when we do a proposal review and maybe we could it's just you know are we saying that we you know as a committee that if we had two priorities you know like we like I said if we had five activities that met those two priorities would we only fund those five activities or would we fund other other categories and so um hmm. <laughs> Go ahead, Becky. Oh, I was going to say, I just have such a newbie question, which has probably been answered in one of my other sessions. No, but the ahead. types of activities, where that does that list come from? Where does that list come from? The is that given to us? The activity is like the project or the program that the right. nonprofit is doing. So let's say the survival centers, um, let's say food pantry, they want additional funding to open longer hours on Saturday. That would be the activity. Right. But my question is where... So the type of activity, I mean, there are obviously other types of activities that organizations do. So that would maybe go under other, but the list that we have here, is that one that's provided to us by- that's something that we've developed as what we see needing, you know, as priorities in the community. Okay. And then they also are, um, you know, verified by DHCD. So, you know, they fit nicely into the categories that DHCD has. So, you know, if there's some, some other one, if there's an other, then that usually means, you know, if we recommend it, I'd have to just run it by, you know, the program reps to see if it actually is something that's eligible, you know? So I've been talking to staff and, you know, for instance, they've been talking about like, oh, could, could like a taxi service for low-income individuals or seniors be eligible? And maybe, but it's a little difficult, um, you know? So for instance, like that, you know, that could be something that you know, if that was recommend or a proposal we received, it would be under other, and then I'd have to make sure that it's actually an eligible activity, depending on how they describe it. Thanks. I thought and this also is a really newbie question. I I thought the community was giving us their input on what they thought the priorities should be. Well, they are. That's what that survey online survey yeah. in town. So, what are we talking about doing? Well, setting separate priorities. We kind of go off of the prior year. And then we either, uh, you know, adapt them to according to what people have suggested. Like we've never, this is the first year we've done this survey. So we're, we're gathering information now to see if we want to take the priorities that we've listed <clears throat> in the prior years would be um, added to or edited according to what has come in on the survey. Like for example, somebody in the new, um, the additional entries that came in said somebody listed that we should um, help fund the common share food co-op in town but I, immediately I thought well that's for everybody that's not necessarily for low and moderate income people so how would that work so how would you list that where would that come under I guess food and nutrition but anyway so mm -hmm. we we take what these activities that are here we I guess we're using the word activity and they're we're using it as activity and we're also calling it priorities and I think maybe that's where the confusion is 
Right. I think it's both. And some of it is DHCD, you know, for a social service, we only fund an activity. So uh, an organization may have many activities, right? They may do a few different things, but they can only apply for one specific activity. They couldn't do, you know, healthcare and then also job training. That's actually two activities, which would take up two of the five, um, you know, recommended proposals. So, yeah, I mean, we're taking what we hear from individuals, what you know of the community, and then, you know, distilling it and, you know, putting it into what we think are priorities and then they, those become the activities. So um, I think, you know, last year we had the most we've ever had. Um, sometimes we have fewer. So, so we could add, I mean, so for example, next year we could add in mental health services or racial justice work or some, I mean, there, there's, I guess I'm sort of, right. that's what I was trying to figure out is, I mean, I, when we right. put in the types of activities we're suggesting to the community what we think their priorities would be. Well, and will be, right? And will be, and based on from knowledge from the year before, and right, what right. they will be going forward. So people have to come up on their own. If they have an idea of something else that would be there, they'd have to come up with it on their own. Yeah. And then right. like one person said, social, you know, send social workers with police. So right. They came up with that on their own, but that's not going to end up being sort of fitting into necessarily one of the things that we've suggested as a priority. Right. And we can extrapolate that and say, you know, is right social service support or something, you know, is that part of a bigger priority? Right. So and we could put that as a, you know, an activity or priority here. So, you know, if there's other comments about, um, you know, that type of social service um, support, it's not necessarily keeping people in housing, but it's a different type of either mental health or response to a need, we could, we could put that here as a priority. It may be that then no one actually submits an activity, you know, submits a proposal for it, but we've identified it. And so, you know, even here we have more than five. So, we, you know, it's difficult. You know, I think last year what we did though was, you know, if there's a range of proposals, it may help to say, okay, well, you know, are we um, um, spreading the the funding to the different priorities, you know, or are we really putting them all in one, one category? So it does help sometimes just, you know, in terms of that review. Mm -hmm. And like, for example, this year, there have been a few requests for transportation mm -hmm. for people that are living in, in low income housing there, you know, it's a mile to the grocery store and there's nothing really here that would fit under that request. So, you know, should we consider I know I'm jumping ahead to number two, but should we consider maybe adding transportation for low and moderate income families? And that 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 would be an additional mm -hmm. activity that we could we could consider. So um, I have another question. I do we only look at the social service applications? Because I I mean that's right, that's 20% of the grant we get, right? And then the rest is infrastructure. Right. right. No, we also we also look at the capital project. So, you know, social services are usually just more competitive. And so we start with this and then there's a non-social service request for proposal that has priorities in it too. And we, you know, I mean, that's pretty, it, you know, usually it just stays the same in terms of, you know, public infrastructure, housing, there could be, you know, last year and then this year, there is some more for like, you know, business support or, you know, technical support for businesses. So that could become a priority. Right. Couldn't, uh, trans couldn't mm -hmm. transportation fall under that or no? No, because it's not a, you know, it's, that's more of a service as, you know, if you're providing transportation, um, you know, rise to people, that's a, to me, that's more of a service. It's not a, you know, a capital project. Okay. And those, those numbers aren't, are, are non-fudgeable. They're not decided by us. What numbers? The, the non-social services versus social service funding. The, per the percentage of the grant you mean? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a, those are the maximum. So, okay. you know, we don't have to recommend any social services. It could be all a capital, but we can recommend up to five activities or 20% of the grant amount. Uh-huh. Okay. There is a cap. There is a cap. Yeah. And I'm glad that everybody's asking so many questions because it, it is, it is confusing at first. It really is when you, you know, if you, it, it just takes one round to kind of get it under your belt. So we've um, kind of um, jumped over one, um, noted comments from the public hearing and online survey and are now Can I say something? Okay. yeah so like the transportation some of these things overlap so like this survival center might do a proposal that includes transportation 
I mean, that that's, you know, a possibility. Um, <laughs> depends on who's writing, you know, which proposal and uh, if they feel it fits in. And it would be under other at this, if we look at last year's priorities that are up on the screen, because we don't have necessarily have anything there that would apply for to transportation. Well, what I'm saying is, is that it might be a component to the uh, foods um, proposal to provide food for people. I mean, there could be like, right, an ancillary piece of that is transportation. But when I hear, say, for instance, and in what some of the comments in the survey, if I hear transportation services, I'm actually thinking like a van service, you know, or some service that is specifically bringing people to whether it's you know, to the store, to medical appointments. So it's not necessarily providing food to them. It's, you know, pro providing them transportation to and from places. But I agree that some transportation could be part of, you know, built into some of these other activities. Support for senior ser services for seniors, for example. Right. Right. And there's a lot of the, a lot of the transportation, uh, you know, commercial transportation services in the area have been cut back or stopped completely. Yeah. Um, so that, that's why it's becoming a bigger issue. All right, so we're sort of, been, it seems like we kind of segued right into two without saying, are we all through with number one, which nobody had any additional, um, no comments about the additional um, responses to the survey that came in. Anybody want to discuss well, that? <laughs> I, I had a quick comment, I, and it's, I guess it probably then um, segues directly into number two anyway, which is um, that like, do we, where do we think we're going to be in a year from now? I mean, I, I know that this is a really good snapshot. The you know the the reviews, the comments from the public of what what's necessary right now, and I, from them, my take is that food stability is there is is the main. Um, hands down winner um, with shelter sort of being a secondary one. Um, but it seems like the, the food stuff is, is particularly on the rise, but do we have any kind of consensus as to where we think we're gonna be in a year from now? Are you talk, be more specific. Well, Are because you... I mean, this is, this is a kind of an unusual year. Um, last year, we would never have anticipated where we are now you know, basically waiting with bated breath for, for a vaccine. Whereas a year from now, you know, like you mentioned um, in the meeting last time, we might be getting a vaccine in July for broad distribution. That could change the entire picture of where things are. I mean, I still think food stability is probably a, a very large, um, so still very highly ranked, but perhaps shelter, might not be as much, you know, or maybe it will be more, or maybe youth development will be more important next year because every, all these kids have been locked inside for a year and a half. I mean, kind of a moving ball. I just wanted to see if anybody had any ideas about where, where do we think we're gonna be? Wish I knew. <laughs> yeah, I would say, yeah, I would say it's hard to know, but the reality is that we'll be, or that the um, proposals will come in in December Right. And then we'll make our decisions in January. Right. So in a sense, we won't really, um, I think the conditions under which we'll review and make those decisions, um, the conditions won't really be very different from where we are today. Uh, right. and, and we're sort of limited by what proposals come in. So we'll just have to make a decision at that point. And if we look at the proposals that come in and, you know, based on those, we think that there will be things that will be more or less important in you know six months from that point we can i think address that at that point but but um you know the reality is we don't have that much control over what proposals come in yeah yeah and we do want some continuity so that these uh, all the programs don't just you know have to fluctuate wildly about their budgets right right right, right. All right, good discussion. Um, thank you for all your contributions. So um, let's continue the discussion on priorities. Um, and and um, Nathaniel put everything up on the screen so you can see where we were for 2020. Uh, and so let's talk about what we feel might be edits or additions for 21 going forward. 
Well, one thing I wonder, and this is more a question, it really goes back to Lucas's question, which I misunderstood. Sorry about that, Lucas, but... Um, I didn't fully but, understand what was going on anyway. I, <laughs> it, it was good to be clarified. I'm in that club too. Um, so, but this question of, so Lucas, I understood your point, you know, that essentially it's not, the cons outweigh the pros of declaring our own priorities, right, is what you were suggesting. And uh, in a somewhat similar way, and this is a thing that, you know, in different ways the committee has gone around on, I think, the last uh, time or two, but this question of how do we want, how do we weigh um, the community's priorities, right, in our own deliberations? Right, so yeah, we have some very clear, and it's sort of related to the even this issue of, right, how do we think, to what extent do we essentially substitute our judgment about what will be happening six, in six months or a year, right, for what the community names as a priority now. And here, and again, we, we don't, we really have been around this in different ways, the committee, so I'm not suggesting we necessarily go down the rabbit hole, but especially with new members, it does get into, I think the question that, the very practical question it raises is, is each of us making our own judgment about how to weigh that, right? In generating our own recommendations, or do we want to have some sort of something closer to a consensus on how much we weigh those priorities, especially since thanks to Nat's good work, it suggests that, right, there's some pretty, pretty clear ones. And again, just picking up your point, Lucas, I mean, right, to the extent that we depart and diverge in some way from what, you know, especially those survey results showed, um, are we somehow doing a disservice to the process, right? Or are we inviting people, like, why would we ask people to share their priorities, have some pretty, you know, pretty clear hierarchy with some gaps, again, as Nat's sort of analysis suggests? and depart from that. Can I ask a question related to that? I'm curious about how many people the survey represents. I mean, I know there's a lot of rows, but I don't understand if that each row is a different person, if one person can weigh in more than once. I, I like, I agree the priorities seem quite clear from that, but I don't have a sense of how many people or what percentage of our population are weighing in on that? No, survey. yeah, there's no, right, yeah, we, right. So someone could submit multiple surveys or, you know, they could let all their friends know or submit multiple surveys. So, you know, it is, a, you know, it's a pretty good response, but it is a small sample. And it could be that, you know, if certain people got the word out, then, you know, some people may not have heard about it or, right, I, yeah, I, but, um, you know, I, what Andrew was saying, the committee's talked about, you know, previously, you know, do, you know, is there a rank order or a weight to the priorities or do we just have them be weighted equally? So when reviewing a proposal, something for support services for homelessness is the same as youth development. And, you know, we're not internal, internally saying, okay, well, when I'm reading these, I think youth development is more important. So I'm going to give it higher scores. Really then every, every proposal we're reviewing is then essentially considered important. And it's really just those review, you know, that review matrix we're using, and it's a comparative review across proposals. Um, you know, if we do think that one or two or three, um, you know, priorities are the highest, you know, do we then automatically give those a higher score in a category? And then that fa may, may factor into how the committee reviews them. I mean, that, I think that's really the ultimate decision is how, you know, how do you want to set that? Is there a way to set that up if we want to do that? I guess and, I was know, responding to Andrew's comment that are we are we individually using our own judgment about priorities or are we accepting the communities? Maybe I misunderstood. That's what I thought he was asking. Accepting the community's ranking, and I don't have a sense of how broad the community is represented in the data. Yeah, I I don't think that the community. I wouldn't guess that the community is very broadly represented, but I would say that. The people who are actually paying attention to this are the people who probably know a fair bit about it and they're probably the ones weighing in as well you know and it does seem to match what the people said you know the survival center lady said that they're seeing 
they're expecting from Feeding America, it says their food insecurity will rise by 56%. And they're seeing those numbers actually fleshing out and food security seems to be the highest priority. So, I mean, it does match up a little bit. So I think you sh we should rely on it to some extent, but it's also, I think I, I'm a newbie, you know, I, I do think it's uh, incumbent upon us to sort of try to try to look down the, the, down the, the hallway a little ways and see, you know, try to balance some of the other forces that might be, you know, coming down the pike at us, you know? I mean, that's great. As, as far as... Now, I was just gonna ask you before you jump in, if, you I mean, you did a somewhat, a somewhat of a summary of the data from last week um, at the meeting, and I'm not sure if Lucas was on the call when you shared it. So if you wanna give a review, a quick thumbnail of what you, the data that you gathered, that might be instructive. Yeah, well, uh, basically, I just tried to take each individual response, and because some people were all like ones and twos, and others might be right. all threes and fours, it was hard to just take a simple average. And so I tried to take how each individual ranked each item higher or lower than their own average, and then aggregated that, and then expanded it to a you know, one to five scale. And so on that basis, you know, and I actually updated it a little bit with the latest numbers that um, Nate shared, as you can see, but basically it's the, um, yeah. you know, food was still, you know, much, much higher than anything else. And there were some, you know, minor changes, but I think, you know, Lucas's main takeaway was correct, that that's what the community um, came back with on this survey. And I guess my, my experience on this committee is that, you know, we don't make the final decisions, right? The town manager makes the final decisions. So we, in a sense, are providing feedback or, you know, kind of the community view to the town manager. And then these types of surveys or the other emails and so forth, the other input that Nate solicits, you know, helps us you know, and inform our views. Um, but I guess I don't see that, you know, because of limitations in how the survey is conducted, I don't see our role as, you know, simply, you know, kind of copying and pasting what the, um, you know, what the, the survey has shown. This is the first year we've done that. And I think it's really helpful, but I don't think that's the, you know, the end of our inquiry. Thanks. Thanks, Nat. And I will say too that the state is not asking necessarily communities to do this. It's something you know we do locally to help with the project review. It's not, um, you know, some communities might say they only have one priority, and it's a like really direct, like a food pantry or the senior, you know, council on aging and senior center. And it's like okay, can't really vary from that much. Um, and you know these priorities are somewhat broad, but they also fit into um, you know projects that DHCD would recommend, and that you know inherently serve lower moderate income individuals and households. So you know I think like for instance transportation is one that you know is it an, has it been mentioned enough that it would be a priority that we put on here to encourage that type of proposal? Um, you know are the rest of the ones that are on here are they still a priority? I, mean, I don't you know I think I want to make sure we don't you know I'd like to finish this tonight because I want to get the RFPs ready by the end of the week to give people time to, you know, submit applications. So unless, you know, I mean, it's really the committee's decision, but I want to make sure we're not belaboring it because if, you know, we could, we could take a straw poll. Do we want to weight them and say, okay, we're going to put one or two up top and are we going to keep them all equal weight? And then while we review proposals, we're not going to individually say, okay, well, I think this type of activity is more important than the other. Essentially then that we're just saying that they're all equal equal in terms of their, you know, their category. Um, yeah, I think it was a good question that, that Andrew raised. And I think, you know, my perspective on that is in January when we actually read the proposals and we, you know, rank each of them, you know, that the first one on the list is consistency with community priorities. And so, you know, we might have different views on that you know, and, and frankly, even if there's something that's about food and nutrition, maybe that particular, um, you know, activity that 
someone is proposing isn't maybe exactly what we think is the most uh, relevant you know, to addressing that issue. So we might say, well, even though it is in the you know, food nutrition category, I wouldn't rate that very highly on the community priorities list or someone else might rate it more highly. So I think we do end up with individual variation, how we view it. Um, and that comes in the, uh, you know, after we read the proposals and we start ranking them. Right, or, you know, I think to Andrew's point that like some people might say, okay, well, food is really high. So then they give the, the relative scores for every review criteria higher because they think food security is more important. But I think Nat, the way you explain it is, you know, your score would just be for that criteria would be higher compared to others. And the rest would just, you know, it's a comparative review. So then, you know, the other review criteria would just be looked at, um, you know, committee members would review those, uh, you know, if for instance, is the finance and budget, you know, good. It's not necessarily you make it, give it a higher score because it's a better, you know, it's for food, a food category, you would review the budget, you know, across the, what we're expecting to be submitted for that. Let me offer just one more thought. Um, we suggest that, yeah, the way we actually have done it in the past, uh, that it's, we're fine, mm -hmm. right? And which is this, and this actually goes back to the mistaken explanation that I was going to offer you, Lucas, about the process, which is, you know, we, we the committee members rank order them, uh, then, um, you know, there are a few that cluster as being highly ranked across members. There are a few typically that cluster as being relatively lowly ranked. And that allows us to concentrate the conversation on the ones in the middle. And we typically, I think, draw the ones, right, define the middle pretty widely. And then all of these sorts of considerations and the differences in, you know, how we prioritize not issues, but criteria, you know, and how we read different, that all comes out. Um, so it ends up being a pretty robust discussion where again, all of these different ways of thinking about things uh, get, get out there in the middle of the table and, and we hash it out. And that's probably inevitable. And probably, and, and I think probably more worthwhile use of time in the end than really trying to, you know, detail how, or get on the exact same page about, about how we arrive at our judgments now ahead of ahead of the fact right good point really good point andrew so given everybody's input and we have up on the screen um the types of activities that were priorities uh for last year um do we want to keep again with this now this discussion has felt pretty thorough is there anything that we would like to change and should we just go through them? Starting with household, family, and individual stabilization. And I'm sorry, just to be clear, when you say change, what we're really talking about is would we take them off the list? Or, or right, or, or add something in else. The past, in the past, we've sort of rephrased them a little bit to be more clear. So Last year, we added the health services insurance navigation based on comments from the senior center, I think. We didn't get any. We did not get any proposals about that, but we added that as a you know, potential activity. And support services for seniors as well, I think was new last year. So those were two new, two additional. So I think that's, yes, Becky, <laughs> to add or change. So anybody wanna throw out anything that they would like to, add? Let's, let's leave it as it is for now and talk about any additional um, activities that we would like to add after having had time to think about this discussion and review the, uh, the survey, which I thought the survey was a great idea. So I, I think that transportation came up a few times in the survey. And Nat, do you have any um, summary on, your, on, the, on the math that you did about transportation before I push my point? Uh, no, just because that wasn't something that um, you know everyone responded to. So those were just kind of additional comments. So there were some things that came in, um, you know, as additional you know, transportation or mental health, or I saw, you know, kind of career employment help. Some of those things were, um, were thrown out there as well as, as well as in various forms, kind of a, you know, racial equity um, 
concept, you know, those sorts of things were were comments, but it was hard to, at least for me, to quantify those in any any real way. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else feel about that transportation is something that would be worthy of listing? It would be exceedingly beneficial for those who need it, but then somebody would have to come forth with a, with, you know, a nonprofit would have to come forth with a program slash activity for it. It would be at, added in, I mean, I know that transportation is a really big issue around uh, people getting their food. And the, um, could it be added like next to other in parentheses? Because we have adult education next to economic self-sufficiency and includes to put it somewhere in a parentheses or with an asterisk explaining it because um, a lot of the issues that people have maintaining their home, employment, you know, food does have a relationship to their ability to get where they need to get. Yeah, I'm just going to clarify that, the adult education. I just want to, I mean, I think it's more than that, um, you know, for economic self-sufficiency. Yeah. I do think transportation, though, Paul, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's different than just for food. I think it could be, you know, rides to medical appointments, rides to just, yeah. um, you know, not just get food, but go to other errands or different um, travel. So, you know, I know mm -hmm. that, the senior center has, you know, is, you know, they, you know, Mary Beth has mentioned as a priority and I know others have said it as a priority, mm -hmm. maybe as you said, because other ride sharing services are not in service right now. So in the last six mm -hmm. months, the, the, you know, the, the be, resources are, are yeah. a lot fewer. That's why I thought maybe just putting it in parentheses next to other, mm -hmm. with, you know, a little explanation. But then anybody that has something that doesn't fit into any of these would would they still be able to check other if we, if transportation were in parentheses next to other, or do we just add it and just say transportation? I have a, another question about it. Philosophically, adding activities seems to me to encourage people to think about this issue and see if they want to tackle it. So I don't see, unless we are bound to not have a lot, why wouldn't we add transportation? I mean, it's okay if we don't get an application for it, but if it's recognized as a possible mm -hmm. issue, why not add it to the list? I don't quite understand if we're feeling like, no, no, no we don't want the list to get too long or what, what, what mm -hmm. that's about. I think that's a really good point, Rika, that it creates awareness of the need in the community. So I advocate for adding transportation. I don't know if we have to be more specific than that. Nate? I was gonna say transportation services, um, you know, that's, I guess that's up to the committee. Are, is, are people on board with that? I have, I have, I have no objection. Andrew? Yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah, Good. I'm fine. Becky, Paul? No objection. I'm definitely on board with that. I also did think that the it, it did seem like the focus was on transportation to get food. I mean, I agree there's lots of needs for other kinds of transportation, but I did, I was just reviewing the survey to try to remind myself. And also partly, I think from the, the presentation from the, um, from the Amherst Mobile Market, which really is almost a form of transportation, bringing food to neighborhoods. Um, so I don't know that we need to specify it unless we would say transportation services, including like it almost feels like transportation should be also included in food and you know food and nutrition comment including transportation specifically to get food. But, but maybe we don't need to be that specific. What if you need transportation to get to a, a job interview? You right. Know? No, but that's a different thing. But I think there was a lot of sort of specifics around right transportation think, around food, and maybe somebody can apply. But I think, but I think to me, that's food and nutrition is the major part of that activity. So, you know, if they can't, you know, they have to, there's some delivery mechanism there, right? Whether it's the mobile market or having a van that does drop-offs or other things. So to me, it's still really a food and nutrition activity. And part of the delivery of it is transportation. And so- um, But I would say, uh, Nathaniel, is not the delivery of the food, but that people need to get to pick up food like at the survival center. And the bus to me, that's not, 
I guess the difference is I'm wouldn't I'm not I wouldn't expect a survival center to then run a van service necessarily for people to get to them unless they want to, but there could be a transportation service available that does all types of transportation that could do that. And so I you know I think it's a little bit different. Um, yeah, I I people bringing food. Or food. Or they deliver food. What's this? I don't think anybody's going to do just a, a proposal around transportation. We don't know. We don't know. They could. Who who could do it? I don't know. That's not for us to worry about. <laughs> well, I think it's, it's well, what if, for instance, PVTA wants to, what if they are saying, okay, well, we can, you know, repurpose paratransit and use a van service in Amherst for 20,000 a year, and they're going to run a pilot, and they're going to see what kind of rides they get. I mean, we, I don't, right, I mean, I don't know either necessarily, but. Mm -hmm. Or what if one of the existing um, agencies decided that they wanted to do a transportation proposal? Right, because they self-select and right. they right. could go into a new area if they wanted, if that was mm -hmm. seen as an, we saw that as an issue for the community. Right, right. Like right. something like family outreach, if they have families going to housing court and they have families going to other, to guidance counselor appointments, when the world, I'm saying like when the world opens up again, it could be, I don't know, a, theoretically it could be something that they do. So I don't want to wordsmith it too much, but we're good with transportation services just that's it, two words, transportation services. Are we all in? Nod your head. Sure. <laughs> I, want to raise, I want to raise just one other one. Um, I, you know, yeah. I won't advocate for it too strongly, not least because I don't know what um, you know the sort of facts on the ground are here in Amherst specifically, but one person mentioned childcare uh, specifically in the context of you know, low-income families and if I remember right, there was a second person who uh, mentioned something that sounded like it could be a reference to childcare in the survey. I'm not sure. I could look it up. Mm -hmm. But certainly, you know, we know, I assume that what's true across the country is true in Amherst as well, which is there is a significant need for childcare, especially again for low income families. So again, I, we don't, I don't have the data. We don't have the data to and it clearly wasn't named by many people. Again, I remember one specifically, but I'll throw it out there as a possibility. I mean, do we nuance or change youth development to include childcare? I mean, is youth is youth development really, I mean, what, you know, is it, I guess if I read that, I think of like enrichment programs or things that are maybe different than childcare, but could they be kind of the same? Could um, you say youth development, including childcare? Or youth, youth, and you know, youth or child care support. Maybe a youth services, including child care. I like that. There was actually one person who said that they thought there should be more in youth development, but didn't really know what we meant by that. So they were worried about putting right. it as a priority. So it probably would be helpful to flesh out what we mean by it. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, we could keep this same format. I think that youth services, including childcare, is fits. Um, for those of, the, of us that have been on the committee, um, it's typically big brothers, big sisters, and the Boys and Girls Club that apply for youth development. So it, it would still, I think, services and develop services still encapsulates what those organizations, the activities that those organizations do. So I don't think they would be questioning like, oh my goodness, what happened to youth development? Youth services would still be there. Is that Nate went away in on that? No, I, I agree. I agree. I don't, I mean, I don't, you know, if they're confused by it, they can always ask, but I think, um, you know, if someone checked other and then explained what they're doing, I mean, we can do, the committee could say, actually, I think this is a youth service activity, even if they describe it and they thought it was something else. I mean, I'm, you know, we're not, I mean, we like to have these activities to help sort out proposals, but I'm not, you know, someone, you know, if we think it's something else, the committee can change it. I'm not, you know, not that rigid about it. Um, no, actually, I just found the comment where it was, somebody said, um, youth development is the number one priority, but I did not select it because I'm concerned on how the town will develop youth and who will benefit from these programs. 
it's a little different than not knowing what it is. Yeah. But the um, yeah, no, child care is interesting. We have funded child care and after school programs um, before, and it's just it hasn't happened um, in a few years. But that for a while it had been um, you know a, a regular activity that was being proposed. So what if it, instead of development, we describe it as you know child care after school teen support. That's really what we're talking about. Are we teen support? Is that something like that? That like describes that. what we've funded in the past, I think. I like that also because it really runs the from the you know smallest child all the way through. That was totally intentional. <laughs> <laughs> you even have it in the right order. You're just growing through. Nat, can you say it again? Will you just repeat yourself? Oh, it just the way it's the way it's it is right now is what I was describing. But the uh, the phrase again, just what you had just said about childcare and. I think I again I changed the document right here. Oh, okay. I have it really minimized because I'd rather see your faces than see the the print. Oh. <laughs> well, I like it now because you know I'm just doing it live, so it's easy just to okay, right. it as we as we speak. I I, 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 you know, I read you. and you're smaller, but okay. Um. I have a really big computer monitor, so. Lucky you. All right, <laughs> youth services, child care, after school teen support. I think that's really work. That's workable, right? Yeah, I think Rika, when you said you know why not have more activities, to me, because we have more than five priorities, we'll call them. It, it's a reason then not to weight them because what we're really doing is trying to encourage different proposals, and then as Andrew and Nat have said, it, the 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 way we use the review criteria, it's going to kind of um, play out there. And so it's nice, you know, to have, I mean, you know, if we can only fund five services or five activities, you know, to me, it's like, then we shouldn't have more than five priorities unless, unless we want, you know, I think it would be hard because we're going to have a, the score, the rank score would be, would be hard to, to use there. But I think having, I like the idea of having these be almost like an awareness piece too. Like, can someone come up with a creative idea? And if not this year, then maybe it's next year, but it's. Um, yeah, just to think about follow up on that, because when we're evaluating the proposals, we're not evaluating the youth services only against the youth services. We're evaluating them all against, all of them against each other. Yes. Right, okay. Yeah. I mean, there is the, there is the piece with um, like the mental health um, services. I don't know if it's the same as um, like racial equity or um, you know, there's a few other comments in the survey. And so, you know, are those other priorities or activities we want to list? I'm just looking at the list. Um, you know, like health services and insurance navigation is somewhat different. It's just, you know, do we add one or two more priorities um, to this? Or is that, are we getting kind of long-winded here, but. Would mental health come under health services slash insurance navigation if somebody really pushed it? That's what I was thinking, but I don't, you know, I guess that, you know, I guess like I was saying, if someone wasn't sure and they put other and they described it, I mean, I feel like that's fine, right? We have the other category in case we don't really, we can't capture it. Mm -hmm. um, All right. I think, I mean, I think the, I'd probably be inclined to leave it as is. I mean, I think what we have down here is clearly include enough in a wide enough range that I think we've sent the signal that we're pretty inclusive right. in what we would consider. And, and obviously you have the other as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are we all fine with this? Yeah. Nice work, everybody. All right. Um, you want to talk about target areas? We don't yeah, have I can pull up the map. That, that'll lead us to the capital project review. Um, so, you know, looking at the map here, the, I don't know how, how visible it is, but the green areas are income eligible block groups that, you know, has already been determined to have a majority lower moderate income households or working age population. And then the outlines in red, orange, and I, I guess we can call that purple are the target areas. And so, oh, Ben, you're being pet. That's so nice. <laughs> A reassuring hand. It, it yeah. is. It's nice every so often. 
it's it's a reverse of having a cat in your lap. Yeah. And, um, you know, so DHCD really wants the community to have like two target areas. We stretch it with three and we can always change this. So one of the reasons we have a public hearing when we um, discuss proposal recommendations could be what if we get a lot of interest in North Amherst or something and, you know, North Amherst isn't a priority right now, but, you know, what if the town and the housing authority and someone else says, wow, we really want to do work around, you um, you know, the North Amherst Library and that, you know, Sunderland Road area. And then we could say, okay, well, we missed it. But, um, you know, we're required to target our capital projects. So most capital projects have to be in a target area. And if they're not, then, you know, we can tweak the boundaries a bit, but really they have to be, you know, in these areas also because it serves low and moderate income individuals and households. So, you know, in North Amherst, for instance, it's hard to say that a sidewalk up there is going to serve lower, moderate income individuals when it's not necessarily an income eligible area. Isn't the library like just off the uh, line? The the uh, what library? North Amherst. And yeah, if people see my my the cursor, it's you know right here. Yeah, really, it's right the, there. Yeah. So it's like right on the line practically. It's because they, right, they but, have no bathroom which has a pretty good impact. But that, you know, the library serves such a range of people, we can't say that it serves a majority lower moderate population. It'd be really difficult to, and there's plans to possibly have an addition to the library with a bathroom. Oh, okay. So I don't know what people think of these target areas. I mean, they're somewhat, you know, somewhat odd in their shape. Um, I just have a question. So on the intersection of Pomeroy Lane and um, those apartments that are kind of behind what used to be Cumberland's, I'm not sure what it is anymore. It's a, a, the co-op? The Pomeroy co-op? Yeah, is that in here? It's the right here. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, this is East Hadley Road right here, this boundary, mm -hmm. and then, you know, these are you know, these are the um, you know, like the boulders in South Point here. This is Hickory Ridge, and then you know this is the intersection. Okay. The town you know has applied for a big grant to improve this intersection. We've applied a few times, and we're still hoping to get different you know uh, investments in this area. We're you know purchasing Hickory Ridge. There'll be an outreach process if that happens to you know possibly for more housing or other services down here. So you know for the town, this is a target area where we're putting other investment in addition to block grant. Mm -hmm. It feels like we don't have a lot of sway with target areas, you know? No, but if, you know, I, I think, you know, for instance, we do think if we think that um, some of the, you know, it could be fine for now and we could wait to see what proposals come in. I mean, someone would be, you know, are we, do we really think that some parts of town are, you know, we need to adjust this radically. Um, I'm fine with it how it is. Anybody else want to weigh in? I think it's a practical matter. You know, it's really the town that's come up with proposals for infrastructure. And so unless, you know, Nate, you're hearing something from the town that, you know, people want to do something outside of these areas, they seem like they work well in the past. You know, I mean, the town, you know, we applied for a few grants for downtown too, for sidewalk improvements. And we're still looking at, you know, making more accessibility improvements downtown in the, in the village center. So it makes sense from a few standpoints, I, you know, in terms of what, what proposals we'll get from um, outside organizations or the town, I'm not aware right now. So should we leave them as is and see what comes in? Sure, yeah. Are we all good with that? That's good. Nod your head. <laughs> okay. All right. Check out. So then for the non-social service um, proposal, where am I? Uh -huh. here? Um, let's do a new share. I have too many documents open, so I want that. The uh, you know what we said before as the priority is to um, you know, meet the goals of the community's master plan by focusing, focusing efforts in the target areas. And so you know, we don't really specify 
um, you know, specific activities in part because there's not a lot that people can propose that are block grant eligible. And the good news now is that the council has actually approved the master plan. Right. Yeah. Good news. Yeah. And do we on Nate on the um, the types of activities on the non social service? Do we have to weigh in on those, or is that are those pretty much preset? Yeah, we can look at those. I guess we can discuss those as well. Um, those are uh, those are um, categories from uh, the state. And so, you know, they, for instance, like a, a housing one, you know, they, it might be considered a rehabilitation, you know, so if, for instance, the housing authority proposes, you know, block grant money or asks for block grant money to fix up some of their properties, that would just be under rehabilitation. You know, it's not, you know, there's no category for the state, just affordable housing. It's, you know, you have to, so these categories are what, what we have to apply under. So there's really not a lot. I mean, under other, for instance, um, you know, Valley CDC applied for my, or for uh, business assistance last year and it was an other, and it's not, you know, it's, and, you know, um, DHC allows it, but it's not one of their typical projects. And so, you know, someone could come in with something that really isn't a, so, a social service and put it as other, and then we could just, you know, review it. I mean, DHC does call this non-social service. It's not capital, it's just non-social service. So it's basically, there's a range of activities that could happen under here. And then we try to, they try to squeeze them into these, these like six categories. But obviously there's other to accommodate anybody, anything that doesn't fit into what's listed here. So, right. we're okay. so, um, so I guess, are we okay with the non-social service activity priorities, everybody? Nod your head. <laughs> Worked well in the past. <laughs> it ain't broke, don't fix it. Okay. Great. All right. And moving on. Um, so you all received um, the RFP that went out for last year. Um, it's been tweaked over several years to make it a little shorter for us, the readers. Um, and with questions that are there, most of them are we can't really, or the questions are necessary, but um, we did change the page limit and some of the supporting attachments, the limit to the, um, to the amount of supporting attachments. So if you wanna start with talking about, um, anybody have any edits or suggestions or anything with the social service RFP? For those of you who've done it before, did the page lengths feel correct last year? Or did you feel like you had enough information from the proposals that came in? I thought last year worked pretty well. It was a, you know, by, by limiting it, I think it was helpful to, you know, get rid of a lot of duplication. But having said that, there was still a lot of repetition. <laughs> but, you know, I, but I, I think it worked well enough. It, I didn't feel like I wasted too much time. Yeah. I will say too that, you know, the state has a page limit when we apply, the town applies. So, uh, for, um, you know, so even if an agency submitted a 40 page proposal, DHCD is only going to want to read like 10 pages, right? I mean, they might say three pages in a project description and then some supporting documentation. So some of it is, you know, our request for proposals trying to mirror what we then ask an agency to, what we, what we then take from them and submit to the state as part of our application. So, you know, to me, it would be unfair if we say you can have a six page project description and the state only asks for three or four pages. And then, you know, after the fact, I'd have to get back to the agency and say, okay, can you cut it or I cut it or I edit it myself, you know, so, um, you know, I think, uh, I think the page limits are helpful. Some of it would be, you know, are the questions we're asking, are they clear enough? For instance, you know, is it, do we think an agency would understand what we're asking for in the budget description, you know, or, you know, are, could we ask for more detail and, you know, the programmatic description, I think. Um, yeah, what happened with the page limits, we've always had some type of page limit, but then what would happen is someone would put in like 10 appendices, you know, to supplement their product description and really and then it becomes a 30 page product description. And that's just, it's too much to, you know, if you can describe a project in a few pages, you know, and it's a single space too. It's not like we're asking for, 
you know, I don't know whatever we say, but you know, I mean, if <laughs> we're hoping people can. So why don't we just do the same page number that the the state same page limit that the state is? Looking yeah, I think last year was worked out fine in that respect. You know, we we allowed people to submit additional material, but we limited the total you know application um, packet to fifteen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when so you said mm -hmm. the that the state only allowed ten, was that just an example? It was just an example, right? Oh. I don't know. Yeah. One very minor suggestion, I was reading this again, and the first bullet point, 15 page limit for required answers and documents, i.e. budget organization flowchart. Let me say, and five pages for supporting attachments. Maybe that might seem like we're really looking for five pages, but if we say, and an optional five pages for any supporting attachments, that would tell people that we don't really need the attachments, but that if they want, supporting documents limited to five pages. Yeah, or up to five pages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that's a great suggestion, um, Nat. Okay, yeah. I'm just gonna... hmm. Gail, uh, Alev had her hand raised if you wanted oh, okay. to. I can't, I don't have that open. Sure. Um, sure. Len, I, I've unmuted you if you. Go ahead, Lev. You're still muted. Yeah. You Sorry, go. can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hi, I apologize. Um, thanks so much to the committee for your thoughtful deliberation on all of this. Um, I have uh, some appreciation of how hard it is to write a really good RFD, so I appreciate the effort you're putting in. Um, I just wanted to, as you're discussing page limits, this is just a kind of a, a, a silly comment, but from the perspective of someone who has responded to it, is that the there's a, a bunch of initial questions that are asked and then there's the project description and there are separate page limits for both of those um, and I think that, that might be where some of the duplication is caused in the information that you're receiving is trying to fit one set of answers into one page limit and then therefore trying to have information that doesn't fit there like go into those other answers so I don't know if it works for you all to have an overall page limit for the total application application or um, to modify that. I think in the in the project description there were a lot of sub questions um, that did make it somewhat challenging to answer all of those in the three page limit of the project or the whatever page limit right. it was in the project description. So I just wanted to offer that as you're grappling with this I totally I'm not at all opposed to it being shorter. Um, I think that my organization might be the culprit of the many appendices and I'm happy to provide you with fewer of those. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to mention that from the perspective of someone completing the application that there were a lot of sub questions which made it somewhat challenging to fit all of those into that page limit amidst the overall page limit, if that makes any sense. It does. I'll just respond quickly, Lev. Thanks. The uh, difficulty is those are what questions that DHCD looks at when they review the proposals. And so they they want all those types of questions, their sub questions answered in that, those page limits. So, um, you know, uh, like I said, I would, feel, I, I would feel bad if we extended the page limit and then, and then, you know, when after a proposal is recommended by the committee in the town, then I'd have to go back and then really try to tweak that basically just by editing it, you know, by cutting out. And so, um, Got it. Yeah, I mean, if the state was more generous, um, I'd say, you know, we could be too, but they're, they've actually, I think just because their staff has been reduced in recent years, they're getting stricter about page limits. Got it. That's totally fine. And again, I'm not offering any specific suggestion to the committee. It just sounded like there was some back and forth trying to grapple with what was the appropriate numbers and reducing right. duplication. So I just wanted to offer the perspective from someone who's completed it. I, whatever yeah. page limits you set forth, that's mm -hmm. fine. And we'll, you know, are happy to adhere to them. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Yeah, there's some questions that don't have page limits and then some, some part of the responses do. And so then it's like, you know, where do you put your, where do you put your writing, right? Like, where do you, 
you can just move stuff around um, to fit, you know, the total page limit. I wanted to, are we done with that? I wanted to offer one thought, mm -hmm. not, not on that issue. Um, if anyone wants to offer a final thought on that issue. Um, the one thought I wanted to offer was, you know, what we did last time we introduced this possibility of, right, we get the proposals, we read the proposal, then we submit to uh, Nate mm -hmm. any questions that we have, which he then forwards to the um, proposal writer, to the, to the agencies, so they can answer those and then we, right, come together and, and hash it all out. Um, on the bottom of page three, that first bullet <coughs> at the bottom, uh, the committee will provide applicants Sorry, questions. Page three, yeah. Going down. So I think there may be a, a syntax problem <laughs> there, but it's a little bit, um, I think we probably need to clarify the process there, because I don't think you read that and understand necessarily right. what what happens there. Yeah, I was certainly confused by that. Here, this, this bullet right here. Yeah, I, I don't, we're not there yet. Provide applicant questions before the proposals are reviewed. So right. I was thinking, well, how do I know my questions if I haven't reviewed the proposal? Right. Exactly, yeah, so we, <laughs> right. So to be clear, we, we read them, you know, individually, right. submit the questions, and but before we get together and, and talk it through. Right. So just we just need, a, I think, a little mm -hmm. different language to clarify yeah. what happens there. <clears throat> good point. Good point, Andrew. I'm just going to highlight this just so we don't have to, you know, I'll, I'll work on, I can share this with Gail this week, but I think that's a good point too. I, and I thought that that was a, um, a strong part of the review last year was having the ability to ask questions and then get those answers okay. back as part of the review. It, it you know, it, it precluded a lot of questions during the review when the committee's, you know, really trying to then, pri you know, make recommendations and not, you know, and asking, well, what does this mean? We can get all that out of the way. So, yeah. It was really helpful. It was. And is that, are those answers to the questions then, they're, they're just additional information not incorporated back into the proposal? Right, right. So, I mean, we, I think last year, um, you know, depending on how many questions were asked of each uh, proposal, we said, you know, like, you know, two to three pages you know, can you, can, you know, can an applicant respond? And so the way it works this year, you know, would be that if proposals are due in mid-December, you know, the committee has two or whatever it is, two weeks to review those. And then by some date, you provide me all your questions. I forward those to the applicants and then they have a week to answer. And then I get them back to you a few days before the meeting when we review them. And so it's just additional information, clarifying information. So do you want to, Nate, you and I will work on that wording or do we do that now? I think, I think just we can work on, I can work on that tomorrow, Gail, and you and I can just, you know, see, I think it's, I, yeah, I, I agree that that's not a. <laughs> it's confusing. That's confusing. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. That was a great point, Andrew. And um, well, well, much appreciated. All right. Um, where are we with our agenda? So we are um, still looking at the RFP and um, any other thoughts as to, I don't know, page uh, format for questions, uh, any other additional information. We, uh, we got way more specific if you look above, um, I don't think Nate has it up yet, but the proposal items in, in years past, we've really tweaked the language about budgets organizational budget versus project budget and made that very clear. So that's something that's uh, been improved on in the past just to bring that up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we do, yeah. Anything else going through? I have a question on the national objective description. Mm -hmm. Are the national objectives the same as the type of activity or that's a different thing? It's a different thing. So, you know, what we're saying here, the way to ensure that it serves low and moderate income individuals, you know, you could, um, you know, you can serve a, a clientele that is majority lower moderate income, 
Um, and then there's other ways to do it if it's an area basis or, or others. So um, what we're asking an agency to do is to say, okay, if, if they think they serve a majority of lower moderate income individuals, how do they document it? So how, you know, how are they telling us that they, they, they meet that objective? And so, you know, um, you know, we can work with an agency. I mean, they might not know all the technical ways or terms, but, you know, if they say, oh, well, we, you know, we do an intake form and, you know, we collect, you know, information, then we could, you know, if they're recommended, we, I would work with them to develop an intake form that has, you know, the required stuff that's needed for participants to, to sign or to complete. I also wondered about that because I it says describe in detail how it meets a national objective and how it will be documented. So to me, they were two different things. And I was curious, how do we know what the national objectives are? Maybe I just I'm found them on the page before. And is it the people who are applying will understand what that means? Is that the assumption? On page Right, four? or they ask, right. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. So the national objectives are the type of activity? No. No, below number six on page five says national objective. Right. So this is a national objective is your first threshold to be funded by block grant, and that's serving a majority lower moderate income individual. So um, previously, you know, or, or up above in the proposal, we just have, um, you know, we have as an attachment what eligible activities are and then what you know, what the block grant does and there's income guidelines. So, I mean, maybe we have to explain that some more, but I think most agencies understand what the national objective is. That's good because it's still eluding me. <laughs> as long as I understand. <laughs> yeah. No, it's good to have some fresh eyes. So let me actually just... Um... So the way I understood that is that's kind of what you do, Nate, because on page nine, where it says proposal review, it's a town staff will first screen each proposal to ensure that it meets the quality requirements as defined below. So as long as, Nate, you know what the national uh, <laughs> criteria are and are able to, you know, do that proper screening, I think yeah. that's... Yeah, and I think some of the, I guess some of this is, um, you know, we, uh, some of this language comes from DHCD, but I think in that I could say, I mean, I think what Rico's asking is, you know, what is the national objective and then how will an agency meet it? And I think we, I could have a better description in here, you know, it could just be another sentence um, and then maybe somewhere in the proposal. So I think I, I'm highlighting it just as something that could be tweaked. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, for instance, I've had a few people in the last um, two weeks email asking about the block grant process and if, if what they think could be an eligible activity. And so, you know, I've been going back and forth with some individuals about whether or not it could actually meet a national objective. So usually if an agency or someone isn't sure, they reach out to staff, which is what we encourage. But, you know, if someone applied, for instance, and they hadn't and they said, OK, well, I think I'm just going to have people self-declare or something, um, you know, as a committee at first, what I would do is I'd want to make sure that they're serving, you know, HUD presumes certain populations to be low mod and then, you know, certain activities may, may, um, may meet that. So, you know, I would right before the committee even gets to reviewing it, I would just, you know, I would reach out to them and I would, you know, probably reach out to my program rep and just make sure it is eligible, you know, on a, on a basic level. And you know we can always work with it once it act if it gets funded. But, um, but yeah, I think I can. I'll see if I can just make this a little clearer for someone who is just you know fresh eyes looking at it and says, okay, well, what are you talking about here? <laughs> okay. And I I just have a quick question. So um, I'm looking at a proposal from last year. Uh, Big Brothers Big Sisters, where they have answered um, project project description and project need. And I feel like there's a lot of overlap because obviously when you write the project description, you're gonna describe the need in it. Do those in fact need to be, according to DHCD, two separate questions? 
could, could, couldn't you say project description and need or in community need? Yeah, I think for social services now, it's somewhat um, combined for capital projects, it needs to be different. So I think for, um, for a social service activity, we could uh, combine the two. Because there has to be some repetition when you're describing, when you, when you describe the project, you can include the need. And then the next question is project need. Right. Okay. I mean, I guess that's a, a question for the committee. If we think that, you know, Andrew and Nat, you've read others. If we feel like that there is a lot of redundancy between those two answers. Um, Andrew. Sorry about that. What I remember is that there often is, um, but certainly not always, right? It's just about how careful people are in trying to speak to one or the other. But I, I seem to think that is one of the places where you can quickly get rep repetition. I think so it is a product description right now is outside the four pages. And so someone could spend, you know, a few pages talking about their project and you know, separate the, the real, the big description of the need, um, but. Well, what if you said project description and need, and then just put the second bullet from project need as the last bullet for the whole section? Because it seems like the two bullets, right? Need project need are basically the same. Uh, you're saying for the, um, as per product description. Right, like change that to project description. You could even do project description slash need, or you could say right, right, need, right, and then just take that second bullet un that's under project need mm -hmm. and add it to the list. So there's four bullets under that right. heading. All right, Gail, you and I can work on that. How does that sound? We can. Sounds good. Okay. Okay. Yeah, like I said, I think for non social service, we really need to have a separate need. Uh, DACD likes to see for whatever reason they want to have it described separated from the product description but for this uh for the other one i can we can change that i don't i don't object to making that change i just uh, will point out though that when we do our evaluation um it, it actually follows you know d e f g and h so we will rank each one on description need community involvement feasibility and impact at least the way we you know, have had it set up in the past. I think we could have it um, read project description and project need. And then you know, we still could have them be two separate review criteria, right? And then we would just. Yeah, um, yeah I don't object. I mean, I, I like having it two separate review criteria because yeah. they might be very different. I mean, a great description, but yeah, the need is not really there. Right. Um, but I don't object to you know, combining that you know the d and e here mm -hmm. okay yeah let thank me just we may need to change this too so all right thank you for pointing that out now. yeah what did you say i said to nat thank you for pointing out that on the matrix it's separated separated out but on the rfp we're going to combine it Is there anything else um, we think that is could be updated or changed? I think we're good. I think everybody good. All right, and then just for one last one is just the um, yeah, is the review criteria which um, you know Nat just mentioned, and I think. Can you make that bigger? Nate? Yeah, uh, it might be too big. You know, so what, you know, we try to keep the same order as the request for proposal. So, you know, consistency with community priorities, agency board information, project budget, project description, project need, community involvement and support, project feasibility, and then project impact. And so, 
you know, follows the same sequence of answers or questions in the proposal. And so what we've done in the past is, you know, a one to four score, you know, and we'd ask committee members to, you know, put a score in essentially for each, uh, under each proposal for each, um, each of these categories. And then, you know, you can, um, you can aggregate those, total those at the bottom, but you send those to me individually and then I create uh, an aggregate score for the whole committee. So it's really not, you know, it's not the committee's, um, you know, it's the committee's recommendations. It's not individual committees members score that really becomes the talking point. It's okay, as a committee, you know, it looks like as Andrew said, you know, maybe these are the stronger proposals. These are the weaker ones and here's, you know, the middle ground and, you know, and then it helps the committee just start the conversation of recommending proposals. But so I don't know, people have been through this, if we like this system, you know, if we find that it, you know, I think some people, um, you know, one to four is not a big range. At one point we had a, a wider score range and we found that, right, people may score, they're a little, they're, a little, they're more forgiving. And so they all score higher and then some people score lower. So in the end, the, it, the range is so great that, you know, an average is really meaningless because of how the, the you know, how they score. Um, well, we had changed that, right, Nate? I feel like with the one to four, and then, um, you know, I think, I think that becomes the discussion point, right? I mean, I think last year, what we did was, um, once we had the scores and we discussed them, we did look at, you know, was there a range, you know, like for instance, did people score certain proposals much higher, you know, in general? No, but, but we had, but we had decided to um, handle that problem that we would actually send you a rank ordering, right? That's what right. we sent Sorry. You. If we had eight proposals, we sent them to you rank ordered one through eight. So not right. raw scores, but the rank ordering, because at the end of the day, that's actually what matters and it avoids or gets around the problem of, you know, some people clustering and all right. people, you know, spreading out. Right. So that way, yeah. So that way I don't even see the scores. You just send me the rank order. That's right. So we right. just do rank order. And then just the other thing I wanted to note on the, you know, these individual criteria, you know, project description, project need, and so on that um, to me anyway, it's, these are helpful as a way of sort of disciplining myself mm -hmm. to look at all, to consider each of these things. Um, whereas, right, it, it's very tempting, right? You read a proposal, you really like it, you really don't like it for whatever reason. Uh, but here, you know, this again, disciplines me to look at each of these things, at least to consider them before I come up with a final rank ordering. But another issue that's come up is, that's come up is, Right, not most of us don't weigh these equally, mm -hmm. right? So we can put in numbers for each of these criteria on a given right. proposal, but typically we don't then, right? Our subjective evaluation isn't arrived at by adding them and dividing by the number of categories, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I guess what in the end, at the end of the day, what I'm suggesting is that we use, again, use them to discipline ourselves to consider each of these things, but then at the end, right, you assign a score that isn't necessarily tightly related <laughs> to each of the, the uh, different criteria rankings. And the most important thing, right, is to come up with some relative assessment, right? You think this one is strongest, you think this one is next strongest, all things considered, and so on down the line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I had a quick question that I think might relate a little bit to this, which is, is there some place where we can get an objective analysis of what the need would be? The need? For certain things? Like, I mean, I know that the community came back with, like, the what, you know, like, what is the literacy rate? You know, I mean, I guess you could look that up, right? If there's a, for a literacy project, but you know, you know, for the project need, is there some way that we can actually look at what the real need is? Like if, you know, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I mean, we can look, I look at, you know, the, the food stability stuff that was, you know, told to us and, you know, you could probably look up some of the statistic stuff, but I mean. I think a lot, a lot of, to, to 
Let me see that. Yeah, I'm on. So a lot of um, the need is defined in the proposals because okay. a lot of the people that are applying have applied over years. So that the, for instance, the um, some of the homeless shelters will will give us statistically how many people have come in in the past, that sort of thing. And the survival center will tell us how many people come in for lunch, how many people have been, how many families, how many different families. So, I mean, I think that's uh, big brother, big sister will talk about how many kids they have and how long their waiting list has been. So I think that's where we get it. I mean, I think we'll, that's more local and I think it's usually pretty accurate. Yeah, I, I would, I would, um, I agree with Paul and I think that it's up to the committees to explain the need and Lucas, to your point, there isn't really like a, a town-wide report that has all the, these types of things and what the need are. So, you know, like, you know, if, you know, it's somewhat incumbent on the applicant to make a compelling case that there is need, right? So if, if someone comes and says, oh yeah, we really need some money to do this. And then nowhere in the proposal are there many <laughs> metrics, right? They don't really quantify things or it's just, you know, mm -hmm. that could be your question. When you're reading the proposal, you might ask, well, I don't see any, you might say, I don't see the project need described very well. And that's one of your questions you send to me. And then we can ask the applicant, can you actually provide us a little bit more quantitative measures of need? Um, I think the difficulty is, right, there isn't, um, I agree, like, it'd be interesting, like, do, is there like a baseline documentation of need for some of this? And there really isn't. So, you know, I'm, I'm, we're hoping that the applicant would provide some of that, but, um, but yeah. Um, yeah, sorry, I had my first time through the process. I now I realize that it's probably just fleshed out as the process goes forward. No, I think it's a good question. Uh, someone else had asked that too, and I was like, well, we don't. Um, and then uh, more recently, people have been asking like what the census has and the census actually has become more limited. And so it is interesting, um, you know, people have been asking certain questions about uh, just different demographics in town and we don't have that information available. You know, I've talked to PVPC and others and it's just interesting, you know, like you think you might have say racial breakdown of certain things and we don't or you might have like educational attainment for certain categories and we don't. And so it's a, you know, if the census doesn't collect it and the state and the Department of Education doesn't collect it locally, Amherst doesn't, you know, we don't have some, we don't, you know, we do an annual survey of residents, but we don't ask all these detailed questions. So um, we're hoping these agencies have a way to document their need, whether it's just even like simple waiting lists or, you know, um, and we've learned how inaccurate polling is these days. <laughs> yeah. These are all really good questions. I, I know it, it helps us expand our thinking. The people that have been on the committee, it helps expand our thinking as well. So thank you, Lucas, for that question. Yeah, and Andrew, back to your point, I do like, right. So I think Andrew was right. I think don't send me your score, send me your rank order. And that way it eliminates, it, it, it actually that order, um, you know, incorporates your personal biases, but it, it plays out in a way that the numbers aren't weighted in a way that, right, if people vary scores widely and they're, you know, they're used to scoring things and some people aren't. And so the rank order is what, you know, then I can create um, a chart and, and that's what, right, that's, that's the way to do it. So thanks, Andrew, I forgot that that was a, <clears throat> right, I think that helps. And ha having nine people in the committee now, that, that will help that process because it will give us a better range, more, more opinions, basically, more numbers. So I would think it'll work better this way. We're only seven. seven. Oh, I'm saying nine in yeah. front of me, so I don't know what that is. Oh, yeah, that's Ben yeah, and I, but we don't, we don't put our opinions. You know, I'm getting old. Paul's going to vote three times. <laughs> <laughs> I knew there was a problem in that. <laughs> <laughs> this is in. It, looks like, it looks like Hollywood squares, but not all the squares. Get get a vote. Somebody have a joke. And so do we, and so in terms of the review criteria, I mean, they, it follows the proposal. And so the, I mean, are there any questions about that or any changes you'd mm -hmm. want to see, or we think it's. I always feel like one to four is sort of limiting. Like I think one to five feels a little, you can get a middle with one to five as opposed to one to four. That's all I'm going to throw out there. But can, then, I, can, I, can you do you could do whatever you want right because nobody's seeing your number so you could do right. 
one to ten if you want well, to. No, no, I mean, if we say one to four, I really want to keep individuals as your mm -hmm. committee members are reviewing it to do one to four and, right. and use whole numbers, please. Don't do like two and a half. Wait, but I thought you were just getting the the no, rank. but I think, but internally, as individually as you rank them, I want we want you to use a one to four score. Time. Because because you can't you can't Becky for instance you I mean for you to be doing one to ten and then Andrew's doing one to four to me I think then that could it doesn't necessarily but I think that range you could then have a different order of proposals I'd rather you know if we think one to five is better individually we could do that but I'd want everyone to kind of keep to that score it forces you to say okay if one's the best five's the least where do proposals fit mm -hmm. in where does each criteria fit in. Also, in terms of discussion in the past, you know, that might come up in the discussion. So someone will say, well, on this proposal, I thought that the description was great, but the need, you know, I only gave right. them a two or something, right? And then it provides a common basis for discussion. Mm -hmm. Do we want to do, do one to five? Use, and, sorry. Do we want to use I an odd that... number as opposed to an even number? Right. Yeah. Go ahead, Rika. I thought the point of the one to four was that we would have to actually choose. And because otherwise, I mean, I, I feel like I know myself and I would gravitate to the middle. And I actually mm -hmm. like the idea of being forced into a four point scale. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. I agree that it should be a small number, whether it's four or five, doesn't matter, but it keeps you from getting to do five and six for everything. <laughs> Nat and Andrew, what do you think from prior years? One to four is, works for you? I'm fine either way. Yeah, I, I, I didn't have a problem with one to four. But. Okay. All right. Leave it one to four. I'm fine. Let's work for Nate. Just play some comfortable music when you're doing it. So, if, you know, if you, if you are trying to go to that middle ground. <laughs> okay. Well done. Yeah, we um, did have, we, I think, like I said, we used to do one to 10 and we, we realized quickly that some committee members were always giving one, twos and threes and then some are like in the eight nines and you know, that range, it's not necessarily telling of the proposal. I mean, is there, you know, is it, is it, are they, were some really that good and some really that bad or is it just, that's how people, their preference of how they use a score. And so um, I think that's when the rank order is mm -hmm. good. So what happens during the review, then there could be a discussion because maybe you know, as committee members ask questions, then we get those back and then there's this order. It could be that, you know, a number of uh, proposals are somewhat tied or, you know, they're all lumped together. And then that really becomes part of the committee's discussion. Okay, well, how do we choose five if, you know, seven are tied? And then like Nat said, that's where you might go back to your own review and say, well, actually, I think this, this budget was weaker. And then that becomes a talking point during the meeting. You know, and we, you have to somehow make those decision points. Incidentally, just just on this very briefly, I want to uh, again give Nat some explicit love for uh, that translation work um, on the survey. Not because you know, somewhat analogously to what we're talking about. Really, I mean, if you look at the the way people ranked, they clearly approach this in a whole range of different ways. Um, that actually would, it would be hard to make what, what you did in that uh, is much more helpful than actually the raw scores, given the range of ways in which people responded to that survey. Well, I did this based on the insight that you provided to the committee over the last year, so. <laughs> oh, stop it. <laughs> it's a mutual um, love fest. <laughs> it's a, but it's a thing to keep in mind, though, because, I mean, these, again, if people are responding, uh, what just really extending on what we're saying about our own rate ratings, right? And, and the different ways that we might be inclined. If we do respond to those things very differently, it can really make a hash <laughs> of, you know, what we take away and the kind of translation that did or, you know, offering uh, rank orderings, um, which is essentially what you did Nat, is actually very, very useful, even necessary to really make good use of these things. So. That's a thing to keep in mind, certainly, if you want to go back to the survey in the future, which I think is helpful in the comments and all of that. Yeah, no, it is. And I think you know, I use Microsoft Forms just because it was convenient to use on our website. But, you know, we do have the town has SurveyMonkey and there's a few other platforms we could use that might do some more statistical analysis on the data, on the responses. And so, 
um, which you know the software I use didn't. And so I, I agree, it is interesting if we're doing this and we start getting, you know, if we expect you know a few hundred responses, I think we have to have. You know, I think next year I would come up with a different way. Uh, if the questions are the same, a different way to analyze the results. Um, you know, and maybe that's a different software just because. Um, you know, there was a range and then there was a lot of comments too. And so thanks Nat for doing that. I didn't, you know, I was, I I'll say I was pleasantly surprised at how many responses we had. Yeah, amazing. Okay, um, so we've discussed the proposal review criteria um, and we we're gonna keep the non-social service the same. We don't, we're not, we, as, as we have. And uh, anything else we need to discuss? Other items not anticipated within 48 hours? Yeah, is there anything else? I was just gonna try to pull up the agenda quickly. Um, so we looked at the priorities and the request for um, proposals. I think we've covered everything. And it's only 8.39. Just, just to, um, hopefully everyone's on board, Lucas and Rika, with the schedule, but does it make sense to just review the timeline again? Oh, yeah. And Becky, too, right? Right, Becky. Yeah, sorry. So yeah. we have November 20th that the RFP is going out. So that's on Nate. Yeah, I was going to pull up the committee's web page. I think I have it. Um, okay. Just to, if we can... I can read it too. Yeah, so we have, um, hopefully by the end of the week, the proposals can be um, you know, emailed to different agencies and you know, put on the website and I'll ask Scott Mears back and you know, try to get all that out there. They're due on December 18th, which, um, you know, I don't, I don't even know what day that is. Um, Friday. It's a Friday, yeah. And then, I'm asking. Do we get uh, them that day, or do you? It takes some time to pull things together. No, I try to. Um, I'll ask, especially this year because I'm not in the office. I could be. Um, maybe I'll have to come in that day. Usually, I try to get them all out that day. So you know, I'll just work that afternoon and get them out at least electronically. You know, by five or something, and then if people, right? So if committee members want paper copies. We can also do that. So um, you know, I think. I've already had two requests for paper copies. Um, and then we just, we can leave them, you can either deliver them to your home or uh, you can come pick them up. But uh, usually I try to get them all out and, and online. I try to get it all on the website that day so anyone can see them. Is, is there any possibility you could just request electronic copies from people or is that just muck everything up? The difficulty is the way we ask for different pieces of information. You know, usually I would take a paper copy and then collate it to how we need it to be read, right? So their budget may not be okay. in the same format, you know, might be in a different software than their their narrative. And then they're, you know, so usually, you know, I'm, I, I, we could ask, I can ask people to email me everything, but, you know, maybe that they, you know, they can't, and they might, you know, some agencies might not have the ability to scan everything or, but I'll ask for it. I think that's a good point. I mean, this year in particular, that might be reasonable. Right. And if we want a, a paper copy, can we get that from you? Yeah, so, okay. Yeah, yeah just ask me and we can do that. Or Ben and I can get that ready. And if we, are, what, what, what exactly are we getting electronically? Is it through box? Is it, is it PDFs? What, what does it look like? We oh, usually I try to scan it all as a PDF. So, you know, it'd be the, you know, everything would be bundled as one PDF. It'd be, you know, the narrative description, the budget, the board, um, you know, if they have like a, a chart, you know, any letters of support, any attachments would all be scanned in as one PDF. Um, so then, um, so then I'd ask that, you know, by January 3rd ish, you'd send me, um, any questions you'd have. And then, um, 
and then I get those to the applicants and they have a week to respond. Um, you know, and then the committee meets on January 14th to do the review of the proposals. So, uh, you know, if we can't do it in one evening on the 14th, then, you know, I'd want to schedule a meeting, you know, shortly after, you know, um, and then, you know, we'd have a public hearing in late January, or it could be early February, depending on the schedule. But at the public hearing, you know, your recommendations would have been reviewed by the town manager. And those, you know, essentially we'd be um, unveiling what, you know, what recommendations are going to be included in the town's application and asking for public comment on that, which is a requirement by, um, by the state that the public gets to comment on what the town's applying for. And does the public comment at the January 14th meeting, like do the people who submitted the proposals or is that really more like what we have tonight? It's more like what we have tonight. So the, the public's you know encouraged to attend a public meeting, but we're not necessarily asking for public testimony. And so the committee review uh, of the proposal is based on what's submitted and the questions and answers, you know, that are the follow up. And, you know, if an agency is attending the public meeting and there's another question we could ask of them, but we're not asking you know people to come and present their proposals to the committee at the meeting, which we've done in the past. We had used to ask um, agencies to make a um, a presentation, and um, you know I guess there's been discussion back and forth about you know the how that plays into the process. You know, is it um, you know is it beneficial? Could someone make a good presentation but not at all really speak to the proposal they submitted? Um, you know, so we haven't, you know, we don't include that. I guess we could go back to it. You know, we'd have to, I feel like this year we're not, I, you know, it'd, throw an, it'd add an extra meeting. Um, we're not really equipped right now, but. I also think that the meeting we had a week and a half ago, whatever it was on the 10th, that's when everybody got their chance to kind of, well, they were advocating for priorities, but they were also advocating for themselves as well. Mm -hmm. And does this work? I mean, are we, you know, I was definitely Zoom, not right? advocating for another meeting. That wasn't <laughs> to be clear. I was just clear on it. So I think, you know, at, you know, January 14th, you know, that's, you know, that we could, you know, I think everyone said they're available. I mean, through Zoom, I'd hate to have you phone in if you're on vacation, but um, I think it's generally good for people. Right, that's a Thursday, and then the twenty eighth is a Thursday. So I mean, we could just, you know, if you know, if it, if if you know, when time nears, if the fourteenth doesn't work, and we need to move it a few days or earlier the next week, and then we shift everything a little bit, we have that flexibility. I'm hoping DHCD. I think the applications will be due um, the end of February. So we have, you know, we have a little wiggle room, not a lot, but a little. Any other questions about the schedule going forward? All right, Any, and anybody else? Is there anybody else out there, Nate, that's waiting? Uh, Lev's still here and I think uh, Ted, uh, um, they, I think he's, he's been here, but uh, if, I guess we could have any public comment if there is any, but they've been the only attendees. They want to weigh in with anything? Um, maybe we put them to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> this was so scintillating. Are you kidding? I hold on. Yeah, Lev's raise her hand. Hey, Lev. I just feel like I have I have to acknowledge that you called. No, thank you all so much to the committee for your careful <laughs> deliberation. I don't need any further uh, further comment, but I just wanted to, yeah, appreciate all of your your service on this effort. Thanks. You're, you're not asleep. <laughs> I am not asleep. I am here. I am listening. <laughs> I did just serve myself a bowl of ice cream. Oh, but, good. You yeah. know. <laughs> I, I, listen to, I listen to meetings at, at, during dinner and my kids now call it dinner theater. So um, it's kind of nice about Zoom. You can you know, mute yourself and you know, don't have to share your video. So it's at least once a week we have dinner theater at our house. It's really great. That's fun. <laughs> All right. Anything else? Are we all set to adjourn? Do we need a motion to adjourn or no? Because this isn't a pub. Uh, I mean, I guess if people want to say we adjourn, it's.
Anybody want to make a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Move. <laughs> I'll second it. Got it. All right. Well, thank you so much. This was really a very fruitful discussion. And I think a lot came out of it. And every year we refine these proposals a little bit more and a little bit more. And it helps to make all of our work a little bit easier when we get to read how many proposals, I don't know, um, come December um, 18th. It'll be really smooth sailing this year. All right. And if we want to pick up proposals, we just like meet you in the back of town hall and have a handoff. Yeah, I, you know, the back door, um, it's, it sounds so shady. There's a narrow, dark alley, and then <laughs> uh, we can, we can, you know, either you can come to town hall or we could have a meeting, uh, you know, a meeting spot or something. We can figure it out. I like, I like hard copies as well, please. Okay. I think I said so before, if I'm not on your list, I would yes. like a hard copy as well. I could, I could become a mail carrier and just bring them around town. <laughs> I'd like hard copies, please. Yeah. Maybe with holiday cookies too, Ben? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no food sharing during COVID. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah, so we can plan on that. If um, Yeah, hopefully if they get in by noon, by the end of the day, we can have you know hard copies ready too so everyone can get them at that, that day. Great. All right, thank you committee for all your hard work. This is really terrific. Really, really well done. And it's 8.49, we can all 